Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right. We're awake. Good. Good morning. Good morning. I hope everyone's been finding the gathering enjoyable, but especially, I hope you're finding this gathering inspiring. My hope is that by being here, you want it's made you want to do better things with your life. It's made you want to live a higher life. A more godly life. I hope that when you go away from here, you leave with a determination to do what is right. No matter what, to go home and live like our true heroes. Men and women like Gideon. Like Deborah. Samson and Samuel. Joshua. The Apostles. I hope that you're inspired to live a story that will be written in God's book. A story that will be spoken from the housetops to God's honor in a future day. May it soon come. If you haven't gotten that sort of inspiration from this weekend so far, consider this a good and almost last opportunity to get it. How many here can understand the phrase, raise your hand? How many people can understand the phrase, raise your hand? Very good. If your hand was up, you can make choices based on God's Word. You have a capacity for obedience. You can obey. And every time you obey, every time you do something right, you make a stand for God. We are called to a purpose in this life higher and more noble and more lasting than anything else man has lived for. The question is, will we stand for that purpose or will we stand for the things of this present world? Will we stand for the truth, for righteousness and holiness? Will we stand for God? Or will we use our lives now for something that will be gone with tomorrow? Some of you may have heard about Custer's last stand on the way here, particularly if you came up from the south like Sister Zara and I did a few months ago. It's where he lost his life, where he gave up everything, truly. That was his stand. And while Zara and I were on that trip, we heard about another stand, uh, perhaps an even more inspiring one that was made. It was the stand that the Jews of Jerusalem made in 1948. We were listening to really an amazing book. It's a true book called Old Jerusalem. I highly recommend it. And it talked about how in 1948, Israel, not even a nation yet, was facing several Arab countries that had vowed to destroy it as soon as it declared its independence. However, before it declared its independence, it wasn't even allowed to train an army openly. It wasn't allowed to import military uh, goods and hardware, couldn't buy weapons to protect itself from these countries who already had established armies, trained and equipped. We call it the Arab Legion. The territory all around Jerusalem as well was under the control of the Arabs. But David Ben-Gurion, the fiery first prime minister of Israel, decided the Jews would make a stand in Jerusalem at all costs. None of the city would be evacuated by Jews, even those living next door to armed Arabs, literally next door to armed Arabs, even though it was practically impossible for them to defend Jerusalem. The supply road to the city was blocked by Arabs. They had mines, they had roadblocks, and they had armed villagers living each side of the road just waiting for Jerusalem's flimsy convoy of vehicles to try to get them food, water, ammunition. Jerusalem was under a modern day siege until Jews were living on rations of about two slices of bread per day and two gallons of water per day total per person for drinking, for cooking, cleaning, and bathing. But even when the Arab Legion's military vehicles headed for Jerusalem, no one left. Not even women, not even children. 
They stayed because their stand was in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was their hill to die on. It was their no retreat line. We are here and we will not retreat. They would stand there if it meant they died there. They knew well the possible consequences. They knew well that their private underground army with hardly any supplies or even food couldn't hold off the Arab Legion if it converged with any determination on the city. But they also knew they'd fight that much harder if they were the only line of defense for their own wives and their own children standing just a few feet behind the battle lines. And they knew in their own mind that the city they'd lost 1900 years ago was worth dying for. They made their stand, and many of them did die in some of the worst ways. And here we sit, with our Bibles in hand, and a world around us desperately groping in darkness. We live in societies that say God is wrong. We can do things our own way. Man's way is right. Will we stand up for the truth? Will we vindicate God? Will we show He is right? Will we show that in our lives, in our words, in our actions, no matter the consequences, that we stand for God and that His ways are a hill we are willing to die on. Remember the heroes of Israel before God. Gideon, Jerubal. Did Gideon make a stand for God? How did Gideon make a stand for God? How did he get his name Jerubal? Let Baal plead. Anyone? Yes, Alyssa. Exactly. He stood up for God against Baal. Was that a hill worth dying on for him? Certainly was. Be sure of it. God said, take your father's bullock and tear down the altar of Baal and cut down the grove by it and build my altar. And you burn that grove on my altar. He said, make a stand for me. Stand up for what is right in a world full of people who are standing up for what is wrong. And did Gideon do it? Yeah, he did. Was he scared to do it? He was actually scared to do it. Judges 6.27 says, And so it was because he feared his father's household and the men of the city that he could not do it by day, that he did it by night. He was afraid. Most Jews in Jerusalem, they were afraid too. Most people, you see, are a bit afraid when they make a stand that may cost them everything. But they make that stand anyway if what they're standing for is worth everything. Ask yourself something. Are God's ways worth making a stand for? Will you make a stand for God's ways even if you might lose friends over it? Even if it might make you less popular? Will you still do what's right? Are God's ways worth making sacrifices for? Gideon knew. He knew God's ways were worth making a sacrifice for. They were worth standing for. His faith wasn't perfect at that point. Still needed strengthening and each of ours does as well. But he acted on the faith that he had in obedience. That action of his to tear down the things that dishonor God, that action took faith. But do you know what else? It made faith. It made faith too. Every time we make a stand for God, it takes faith and it makes faith. Every stand we make for God takes faith and makes faith. James 2, verse 21 and 22. Was not Abraham our father justified by faith 
when he had offered Isaac his son on the altar, seest thou how faith wrought with his works? And by works was faith made perfect. In the ESV it reads, you see that faith was active along with his works, and faith, his faith was completed by his works. His faith was made complete when he acted on it. Every time we choose to make a stand for God, every time we choose to obey Him, it takes faith and it makes faith. It makes our faith stronger, more complete when we do things right. When we make the truth our heel to die on, we gain faith and assurance from that act. Turn back to Daniel chapter 3 that we read. Daniel chapter 3. And look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's statement for a moment. These are some heroes who made a stand. When the command of the king was disobeyed by these three faithful, Nebuchadnezzar gave them one last chance to obey him. Daniel 3. Let's look at verse 15. Daniel 3, chapter 15. Uh, sorry, Daniel 3, verse 15. Nebuchadnezzar says to them after they've disobeyed, he says, now, listen here. If ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made, well. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, if God chooses not to deliver us, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. How's that for making a stand? You want an example of standing up for God when everyone else is going right along with wickedness? Talk about peer pressure. Every prince, every governor, every captain and judge and treasurer and counselor and sheriff and ruler, anyone of any consequence in the whole known world, bowed as commanded, except three. They stood like lone trees in a sea of prostrated people. They were impervious to the influence of wickedness around them. They stood for what was right. Proverbs 28.1 says, The wicked fleeth when none pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. They made a stand for God. They made it clear that His commands would be their heel to die on, if God so allowed. Where will we stand? Where will you make your stand? What is your heel to die on and is it worth it? Where will you stand?